morning, everyone. Uh, bright and early on a Monday morning here in Washington, but uh, maybe early afternoon, late morning uh, for our guests online. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cook. I direct the Institute for African Studies here at the Elliott School for International Affairs, part of uh, the George Washington University. We are so delighted today to be part of this partnership uh, with the Search for Common Ground, with the Social Science Research Council, with the African Union, and with the U.S. Institute of Peace. It's really, it's really a, been a fabulous to be part of this preparation, and I'm looking forward to a terrific event today. Um, we are, uh, the Institute for African Studies serves as something as a hub for research, for dialogue, for debate, uh, for teaching that connects uh, faculty, students from across the university, researchers, policymakers, and all those who have a uh, voice in kind of shaping uh, international engagement. Um, we, one of the important missions that I have is to elevate uh, the understanding of Africa and contemporary Africa in the study of international affairs. It has often been uh, somewhat marginalized in, within schools of international studies. And I'm so delighted that uh, students here, whether they're going on to careers uh, focused on Africa or not, um, are uh, interested in Africa, interested in learning more, interested about learning uh, about the challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead. Um, I'm also kind of inspired um, by the young people here at the Institute and, and young people that I meet today. I feel like there's something in the water these days because I sort of certainly wasn't uh, uh, so together when I went back in my 20s. Uh, and um, we are, we're trying to build at the school kind of students who will be leaders, who will be uh, compassionate, informed, competent, uh, and passionate leaders as well. And I think this summit is gonna feature some uh, uh, you know, a wealth of youth voices um, with the same qualities. We, we're on the edge of the US-Africa summit here. I would say it's not an especially young bunch that will be um, at the summit. Uh, there will be many promises and pledges and partnerships made. My hope is to see much more focus on kind of global equity, uh, inclusion, um, and uh, kind of real, uh, real genuine partnership. Um, but it's going to be up to uh, the youth of the United States and the youth of Africa to hold leaders to account for what they promise to do today and every day. And so um, I find uh, uh, this particularly inspiring uh, and energizing event. I'm looking forward to a fabulous day. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Susan Steigert uh, from the US Institute of Peace. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Those online, um, we're so glad to have you here. Uh, we're going to have, I think, uh, pretty much hundreds. Uh, I think 700 was the number of people um, who have registered for this event. Um, so it's going to be a really exciting day. Susan. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those who are joining uh, from other time zones. Uh, my name is Susan Stigant. I'm the director of the Africa program at the United States Institute of Peace. Um, we are just down the road. My direction is terrible, but uh, just down the road. Um, and uh, for those who don't know USIP, we are a nonpartisan public institution uh, that works to help to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict around the world. And so the focus over the next few days on questions related to peace and security and the many aspects of partnership that underpin that are entirely central to, to our mission. As um, I was thinking about the, the conversations uh, over the next week, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for US and African leaders, and I count those people who are in the room, not just people who hold senior positions in governments, to really talk through shared priorities, uh, to talk about the changes and the structures that are needed to advance genuine partnerships. Uh, over the last few days, we've had the opportunity to sit with the African Union Youth Ambassadors for Peace, who, who you'll meet uh, today and over the course of the conversation, 
Uh, and they really drove home this fundamental pillar of partnership and coordination. Uh, and I think that's something that, that we can discuss further over the next, the next several hours. Uh, and I think that partnership matters uh, to really build on the tremendous potential across Africa and in the US-Africa partnership to work together to address challenges that exist, and then to think more broadly about the shared opportunities and challenges across the globe, not just in the US-Africa partnership. Uh, I'm struck that the title of the conference today is about peace and trade. Uh, and as we think about the conversations in the US-Africa Leaders Summit, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for investment in trade to underpin some of the fundamental shared values. Uh, this type of investment, the way that investment is done, could be one of the greatest engines for democracy, for transparency, and for peace and security. And I know that people in this room, people who are joining us online, have ideas about how to make that real. I also think that there's a tremendous opportunity in these conversations to anchor the discussions in the frameworks that already exist. We aren't starting from zero in US-Africa partnerships. We're not starting from zero in terms of the priorities that the African continent has set for itself. And so if we think about Agenda 2063 as one of those core pillars and organizing principles, as well as the continental framework for youth peace and security, there is a way to frame our conversation. So look forward to hearing people's thoughts on that. Um, and then finally, I, I think that there's this a need to start to shape the formal structures that will underpin partnership. Partnership and coordination don't just happen on their own. They require goodwill, they require energy, and they require regularity. Uh, and I trust that people in this room will give us some good ideas going forward. So uh, I want to thank uh, our partners from George Washington University, from the Social Science Research Council, from the African Union's Youth for Peace program for Search for Common Ground, um, for working together with USIP in this conversation. And I look forward to the energy, the ideas, uh, and then to seeing many of the young people who are in this room as part of the conversations in the rooms, at the tables, and shaping the debate as part of the summit and then in the hard work that will be required to follow up. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer and Susan, for those kind opening remarks. Uh, now we will move into our opening discussion uh, for this event. And I'd like to wel uh, uh, please welcome our, our panelists and moderators uh, to our, our lovely stage here. <laughs> For our opening session, we are honored to be joined by the U.S. Special Representative for Racial Equity and Justice, Desiree Cormier-Smith. The Special Representative leads the State Department's efforts in addressing and fighting racial discrimination across the world. We are also honored to be joined by Dr. Rooks Akko. Uh, Dr. Rooks serves as the Senior Analyst for the African Union Commission, as well as the Youth for Peace Coordinator within the African Union. Dr. Rooks is a distinguished scholar with over 50 published academic outputs. This opening discussion will be in dialogue with Rising Achaleke Christian Leke. Achaleke is an African Union Youth for Peace ambassador representing Central Africa. Achaleke leads one of the most prominent youth focused organizations in Cameroon. It is my honor to hand over this first opening discussion with to Achaleke. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for the very impressive introduction, uh, Phil. And of course, it's indeed a pleasure to uh, be, be here with Desiree. Desiree, it's a pleasure having you. 
and um, we have hundreds of people joining us online and of course those who are sitting in this room thank you all for, for coming uh, indeed today i'm very excited uh, that this conversation was fashioned in this way uh, traditionally we'll get uh, very nice speeches but in this case it's more of experience sharing and of course having a young person like me to be able to uh, serve as a moderator as well actually shows how the inclusivity is at the center of this conversation. So I really want to thank the organizers for making this happen. And of course, all the partners uh, for this event. Thank you so much. And maybe let's give ourselves a round of applause so that we keep the group so, so many, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good event. And, and then we need to give it uh, the good energy. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much. And like it was mentioned by Phil, I'm going to use my phone because uh, it has been properly structured so that we get the best of the conversation. So permit me use my phone because we have some questions which I'll be reading uh, to, to refer to uh, our speakers that we have. Okay. We currently have Dr. Ruth Akko um, online. Uh, thank you so much for joining despite uh, uh, your, you know, difficult morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruth. <laughs> um, so um, I will start with Desiree here present. And uh, of course, um, I'm sure it should be a very tiring week for you because it's lots <laughs> on your plate. Yes. <laughs> but, but permit me uh, pull out some of uh, the best of you this morning, I, I guess. I will try. <laughs> <It's very laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Desiree. I, I know that you were recently appointed um, um, in June yes. as the first ever U.S. representative on racial equality and justice. Can you tell us a bit about your mandate and why uh, the Biden's administration conferred to you uh, this very uh, humble uh, uh, job to do. Yes, thank you for starting there. It's an important point. Um, I will uh, just gently correct you on something. So my title is actually Special Representative for Racial Equity and Justice, and it's important that it's equity, not equality, um, because equity is a means to equality. Equity refers to the specific and the proportionate needs of traditionally and historically marginalized groups to reach equality. And so that's why it's very important that my title is racial equity, not equality. Um, and I think one visual that I love to share, and if I uh, had the foresight, I would have brought a PowerPoint presentation, but for one slide, it's not really worth it. But the visual, I'm gonna try to walk, talk you through it, um, is three people behind a fence. And one person is naturally tall enough to see over the fence. One person is a little bit shorter than the fence, but maybe can look over if they sit on their tippy toes. And one person is quite short, so can't see anything but the fence itself. Now, equality would be giving all of them the same size stool. And so that may mean that, well, that will mean that the tall person gets to see even more clearly over the fence, right? It could mean that the middle person now finally gets to see over the fence, but it could also mean that the short person still cannot see over the fence. Equity would be giving each of them the stool of the appropriate size so that all have the same view over the fence. So that may mean that the tall person doesn't need a stool, so he doesn't get a stool because he can already see over the fence. It may mean that the middle person gets a, a short, stool so that they can now see clearly over the fence. And it means that the short person necessarily gets the bigger stool so that they are the same height as everyone. Justice would be the removal of the fence altogether. So this is why the title, my title is very, very important to me and why we push for these specific words because words matter, language has power. Um, that is another reason why I don't use the term minorities. I think that the term minorities is pejorative and it serves, it serves to make people feel smaller and more isolated than they are. And plus, we're actually the global majority. So it actually is inaccurate to call people of African descent, indigenous peoples, minorities, right? Because we're the global majority and that is powerful. And it's also, again, words have power. And so how you talk about people, how you talk about these groups, and how you talk about why they find themselves in these situations is really powerful. They are not among the most world, among the most marginalized in the world because they are somehow naturally um, unable to do great things. 
it's because of the historical legacy, generally speaking, the historical legacy of colonization, of the transatlantic slave trade that have led to conditions that persist to this day. And so my position was creating an acknowledgement of that. My mandate is to um, ensure that US foreign policy programs, engagements, and assistance serves to promote and protect the human rights of members of marginalized racial and ethnic communities. That includes indigenous peoples, it includes people of African descent. It is also um, to ensure that US foreign policy serves to combat structural racism, discrimination, and xenophobia. And it is because, not because the US has it all figured out, right? It's not because the US has solved all of these problems. It is because we acknowledge that as we grapple with these challenges here at home, these are global phenomena and they will require coordinated and sustained global cooperation to solve. Thank you so much. I mean, um, it, it was very, very important that you started by clarifying. <laughs> I think the equity conversation really set uh, the base for, for how reflection should, should look like. You know, I really like the analogy of, you know, our people over the fence and how we try to ensure uh, that justice takes, you know, away that fence. I think this is really, really critical uh, for the things that you highlighted. And I really enjoy the fact that you are reflecting around sustainability. Yes. It's very important and coordinations. Uh, these are things that are really usually missing uh, in efforts. And of course, kudos to, to your appointment uh, to lead this very uh, important role that means a lot to you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Dr. Rooks, I'll move uh, over to you, um, basically, um, to, to have you share with us um, from an African Union perspective. Um, you are an institutional leader uh, within the African Union. Uh, can you tell us uh, much more about the African Union's uh, uh, um, effort to have young people participate in conversations around uh, peace and security? Thank you, Dr. Ruth. Uh, thank you so much, Christian. And let me also um, join uh, Desiree in uh, Acknowledging your 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 role as the uh, moderator of this really interesting session, and also to thank you know all the organizers for you know really putting this together. Uh, as uh, Suzanne said in her opening remarks, um, you know partnership and coordination really takes a lot of effort, time, and I think um, uh, kudos to everyone who's uh, put hands together to to make this happen. Um, in answering your question, I'm also going to um, um, really take off from where Desiree left off so we can keep the conversation flowing. And I would say that um, the, the Youth for Peace Africa program is the African Union's um, attempt to provide some equity in terms of having citizens' engagement in the peace and security agenda. Now, you will agree with me that uh, before uh, 2018, when the program was inaugurated, uh, if we were going to talk about the landscape of peace and security in Africa, you would be expecting to hear, see, and, you know, feel the experience from, if you like, the more experienced or the older generation. However, since 2018, what has happened is the African Union, through the Youth for Peace Africa program, decided to make a dedicated attempt to mainstream young people into peace and security. And that's not to attempt that the AU is tooling or retooling these young people. It simply means, uh, using Desiree's analogy, that they have provided a taller stool for young people to be recognized and appreciated for the work that they already do. So the African Union through this program is simply one, recognizing the role and contributions of young people to peace and security in Africa and beyond, including those working within their specific communities, two, to promote the work that they do through enhancing, not building, enhancing the capacities that they have by ensuring they have spaces to, for peer-to-peer -peer learning and sharing of experiences to ensure that they have 
avenues for intergenerational dialogues that are essential to bridge the gap between generations to promote to that sustainability christian that you you mentioned as you you were you were sort of summarizing um desiree's um intervention so what i can tell you is that this program is one that his, it has not only been created to mainstream young people, but is also one that gets its direction, its priorities, and everything it does from young people themselves. Uh, and what I mean by this is that when the program was inaugurated in 2018, it wasn't the typical institutional mandate of creating a program and, and giving to them the priorities. It was create a program, and then the program went to young people on the continent and said to them, what are your priorities? This is a program meant to serve you. What are the things you want this program to achieve for you in the short term and the mid term? And the priorities young people um, sort of highlighted in that inaugural um, setting was that they first they needed to change the dominant but wrong and a, a, a perspective that young people are synonymous with trouble. The second was that there was a wide gulf between young people and their policymakers, and that they needed that to be bridged. The third was that they felt they were doing so much work in their local communities, especially, and that these efforts were not recognized, and so they weren't appreciated as partners in peace building. And finally, that they felt that they required some framework that would not only promote the work they did, but ensure that they had certain protection to ensure that they're able to continue that work. And so the very first thing that this program did after its inaug that inaugural meeting in September was to lobby the African Union Peace and Security Council to hold its first ever open session on youth peace and security. And this was held um, in November. And I, I think here it's it's a pleasure that Kristen, that you were part of uh, the court of young people that were brought into Addis Ababa uh, in November 2018 to, to, to figure out uh, the address, you know, the representation to be made to the Peace and Security Council on behalf of young people. So I think if there's a testament to the essence of the program and how it ensures that young people are the center of the program. I think uh, I would I would say you are, you are a testament to that. Uh, but just very briefly to 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 round off, what what did we do with those four priorities? At the PSC session, we we well we were fortunate to have a really good uh, presentation. And the PSC took it upon itself and decided that annually there would be a dedicated session to YPS. And I think this has really contributed to the you know, evolution of um, YPS on the continent. Secondly, council decided that the program should carry out an empirical study on the roles and contributions of youth to peace and security in Africa. And this study was um, endorsed by council in 2020, two years later. And this study really looked into several issues from a regional perspective, because Africa is not homogeneous. Even the regions are not homogeneous. But the study went deep into countries, had focus group discussions to really tease out the great work young people were doing, the challenges they were facing, and practical policy decisions that council could make to mitigate these. Thirdly, um, the council mandated the program to speedily conclude on the finalization of the, what is now the continental framework on youth peace and security. Um, and this also was um, adopted by council in 2020 um, at, at, at one of the um, sessions. Uh, and I think, Christian, what I've, what I've tried to do here is to sort of show that, one, the AU is really intent 
and purposefully so, in promoting YPS. And it's not the case of, if you like, equality, 10, 10 youth, 10 um, older generation, but that of equity, as Desri you know, really showed us in terms of that analogy to say, there are different levels and we need to bring everyone to that level where we are seen as collaborators, partners in peace building. Um, and I think here, Kristen, uh, thank you for the question. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rooks. And uh, I really want to thank the organizers. Sometimes it's quite inspiring as a moderator uh, to be moderating two very knowledgeable and passionate people, you know. Um, I, I can really feel that. And, you know, the, the whole idea that Dr. Rooks was able to cue uh, the conversation of equity and to be able to be on that is really uh, very inspiring. But I mean, he mentioned very key things, which I think, as he rightly said, I actually had the honor to, to witness this process, uh, being the first young person to address the AUP Security Council. And, and since then, we've seen progress at different levels, nationally and also at the intercontinental level. And of course, bringing this conversation to look at how to strengthen a U.S. and African partnership, I think it's it's really, really transformative. And of course, today we have the five ambassadors um, you know, mandated by the AU Business Security Council to work with their peers. I think this has gone beyond just feminism to uh, things which are more uh, of practice. But I'm coming back to you, uh, Desiree, and I really enjoy the fact that you are nodding. Uh, this means we are having the best of you. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, we, we are coming now deeper and we want to reflect around uh, the relationship, the nexus between uh, equity and, 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 and conflict. Mm -hmm. And let me pose my question directly. Uh, we know that political and social exclusions for whatsoever reason can create conditions for conflict in any society. Can equitable policies, caution to racial and ethnic justice play a role in conflict prevention? I think so. Um, I, I think, as you said, we've seen how inequities can lead to conflict. In extreme cases, they can lead to genocide, right? When one group of people, simply because of their race or ethnicity, is othered um, to the point of dehumanization, um, to the point where they are blamed for all of a country's problems, all of societal ills, that is very dangerous. That is very dangerous, and we've seen it in really dark ways play out on the continent itself. Um, and so, yes, policies that promote equity for marginalized groups will lead to more peaceful nations, will lead to more prosperous nations, will lead to more stable nations. And that isn't good only for the marginalized group. It's actually good for everyone, right? Um, when you have an entire group of people regardless of how big they are in terms of the percentage of your population, when you have an entire segment of your population that is simply, that is prevented from getting a quality education simply because of their ethnicity or race or any other characteristic, that is a drain on your economy overall. Because what does that lead to? That means that they are not able to get quality education, which means they're not able to get quality jobs, which means they're not able to contribute uh, fully to the economy, which means they're not able to really realize their full potential, which is uh, an, an inherent human right. Um, and that means that your economy is losing out. Think about all the opportunity costs that are lost because of that. Um, you could be preventing the person who has the cure for cancer uh, in, innately in them, but because they weren't able to see through their education, we missed out on that. Um, so I think really acknowledging and underscoring that this, that racial equity in particular is not just a nice thing to do. It's not just a feel good thing. It is a national security imperative. It is an economic imperative. It is a democracy imperative, right? Again, going back to using that same analogy, when you have an entire group of people who's prevented from participating in the political system, uh, because of their race or because of their ethnicity, that's not real democracy. And again, I'm coming at this and from a very humble standpoint, not because the United States is perfect. We are far from it. Um, and I, we don't proclaim to be. We're speaking about this from experience, frankly. 
which I think, um, you know, coupled with that humility makes it a much more powerful position uh, because we are not saying, you know, my job, let me be very clear, my job is not to uh, admonish or lecture other governments about uh, the realities of racism in their countries. It is a, again, it is an acknowledgement of the global nature of racism, an acknowledgement that if we are uh, truly to be um, a champion for, for eliminating racial discrimination, xenophobia discrimination, we have to be a part of a global community that is committed to doing that. And we have to start with ourselves. So as we are trying to do that hard work here at home, uh, we also acknowledge that we can use our policies overseas to meet these same goals, right? To um, help these communities in their pursuit of justice, in their pursuit of equality. Um, and this is, again, us starting with our own policies. So it's taking a critical look at our engagements in each of the country, in every country around the world, regionally, multilaterally, and sometimes acknowledging the hard truth and that maybe our policies are going along with these inequities um, or worse, exacerbating them, right? Instead of challenging them, instead of using our power, our influence, to actually support and uplift these communities. And how do we know how we can do that or where we should start? It starts by listening to them. This is not a, uh, a situation in which, you know, I'm trying to be a voice for the voiceless. This really is um, encouraging my colleagues and, and myself to actually engage with members of these communities in every country around the world, listen to them. They know better than anybody else the challenges that they're facing and they know better than anybody else what they need to overcome and how the US government can support them. And so we have to start by listening and being committed to actually incorporating in a meaningful way what we're hearing into our policies. So it can't just be a nice to do, you know, round table and then, okay, we check the box, thanks so much. It is also holding ourselves accountable to, uh, to the implementation of that in the monitoring of that and that evaluation. And how we do that? is really checking in with these communities, having an engagement and dialogue and saying, hey, you know, based on our conversation, we heard you say that if we did this differently, that would help you. How is it going? What has changed? And if nothing's changed, then maybe going back to the drawing board and say, hey, okay, we tried that, that, that wasn't so effective. What else can we do as the US government, right, um, to support you? And that last part is really important because I've noticed in my travels around the world, I'll ask communities, like, what can we do to support you? And what they're calling for are things that are beyond our control, frankly. Um, they're calling for constitutional recognition in their country. We can't, we can't do that, right? We, we, but we can, if they say it's helpful for us to encourage the government to do that, that's what we can do. And so again, it's, it's having that conversation and starting um, by listening and not sort of telling these communities, okay, now we want to empower you. Here's what we're going to do. It's, hey, we want to partner with you. Uh, how can we help? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Desiree. I, I mean, I must, I must confess, uh, the core values, which is in your job, as you say, in terms of listening to people, collaboration, uh, accountability. I mean, these are core conversations in, in building peace. And yes. I mean, I dare to say uh, that your money is actually one of the tools uh, for, for peace building. Uh, you know, across the world. I really want to celebrate that aspect. And of course, um, you, you really frame it from a perspective of humility and experience. I mean, uh, we all understand the experience that uh, this country has in terms of this conversation. And uh, using it with some level of humility uh, goes a long way to speak also to core values around peace building. So yes. sincerely, I really, really want to appreciate the way in which you've been able to frame this and, and how it has been working. Now, coming back to Dr. Rooks uh, once more. Um, um, Dr. Rooks, um, I, I want us to reflect a bit also uh, similarly to, to, to uh, this race conversation. Uh, in your view, how has youth-related conflict prevention evolved over the past few years? What areas have been the most expansive? Can, can, you, can you reflect a bit around this, this, this question, Dr. Rooks? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. And I, I think to answer that uh, question, one would obviously have to begin with what we're referring to as uh, conflict prevention. Um, for me, two things. One, 
stable or society. You don't want conflicts to break out. But then again, you could have um, countries in transition or countries just out of um, in, in PCRD, so post-conflict uh, reconstruction development mode. And then you're looking at preventing you know, uh, conflicts in those settings from um, either <clears throat> reoccurring or escalating. So the way I will take this question is to say that for me, conflict prevention is, is a whole continuum. And I think um, this is where we see um, youth and their networks working um, tirelessly to ensure that, you know, they either they have um, stable, peaceful communities, or B, that they don't, um, um, their communities don't uh, reverse in terms of the peaceful gains that uh, have been made over, over a certain period. Um, now, interestingly, and I'll refer to the study on the roles and contributions uh, of, of, of youth to peace and security in Africa, what, what, what that study showed was that young people work along the entire continuum, the entire phase from, you know, peace to um, stabilization and uh, post-conflict. However, if you ask them what um, roles they play particularly, they may not be able to say to you, I'm PCRD, okay? But what they will tell you is, I'm doing conflict prevention. And so from, from sort of that, I, I wouldn't want to um, not acknowledge the roles of that certain um, folks play. So for me, I think it's the entire gamut of 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 the of the spectrum that young people are involved in. Um, and the way it has evolved over the years or the past few years is that um, what I've seen with the program is that young people are now more and more coming out to tell their stories. There are more avenues for them to interact with their peers. There are increasing avenues to interact with policymakers. And indeed, the Peace and Security Council itself on several locations have said to the program, this um, open session, we want to hear from young people who have experienced conflict and are in post-conflict mode. I mean, this happened last year, and we had to bring uh, three young people from uh, member states that had that experience. And council actually requested of them during the sessions to say, we don't only want to hear your experiences, but we want to hear from you, if you are on this other side, what practical policy decisions would you be making? And I think in terms of um, um, the evolution, I think it has gone beyond young people working in their limited spaces, to them being recognized and acknowledged, to them being, um, um, and in terms of the recognition is to also say that um, there is now uh, later this month, um, an award for three youth networks, you know, that have done so well in 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 peace in the in the YPS field. And I think this sort of recognition not only helps to bring out you know the winners but it brings out a wide range of um applicants that we would otherwise be unheard of so for me they are all winners because they are telling their stories through different medium either through the study through the application to win an award through participation in intergenerational dialogues or peer-to-peer -peer experience sharing um, processes. And I think for me, this is where we want um, um, the stories to be told. This is the way we believe that um, young people can network, young people can learn, learn, young people can share. And I will give you a practical example. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Juba. Um, and young people in Juba were speaking about how they felt that their, their, their situation was hopeless, a young country, conflict, um, 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 post-conflict, and, you know, uh, really thinking that this was something that had happened to them and them only. But by the time young people from other uh, uh, countries who were present, you know, uh, in, in, in that conversation said to them, oh, but hold on, in Nigeria. Independence was in 60, changed style of government in 63. 
there was a civil war by 67, you know, and, 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 and everyone shared experience. They thought, oh, so we're not alone. This is something that has happened. And what immediately that does, it, it helps have a different perspective to that feeling of hopelessness to realize that perhaps this is um, a shared experience and there were ways other countries that they sit back and think have advanced or are way better than them went through, okay? Uh, another example was in Ethiopia when they were, the, the elections were going to hold a, a few years ago and um, young people were saying, um, you know, we, we, we're not given the space, we're not allowed to, 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 to advocate our political rights and so on and so forth. We held a conversation intergenerational conversation where we brought young people from uh, other member states that had gone through similar processes. So the Gambia, uh, Nigeria, for example. And when they had these conversations, you could see the young people in Ethiopia thinking, oh, wow. So this is not the time for us to, to, to be violent. It's actually a time for us to get ourselves together and begin to have conversations with the institutions on how young people need to be engaged in the political process as a tool for conflict prevention. So what I'm saying here is um, that I will not single out any aspect because I think they, it's a continuum. And I'm saying also that there are different ways by which um, uh, this has evolved. And if you ask me what area you know is has been the most expansive, again, I won't I won't say a particular one, but I think the role of the IAPS for, for me is one that I think has really done a lot because through that initiative, young people are now accessing spaces where ad hoc representation would not fare as well. And what I mean by that is um you're all here at the uh, US Africa Leaders Summit. Let's assume it was just a random five. You were at the TANA High Level Security Conference. Let's assume it was another random five. Uh, you were part of the conversations uh, for COP27. Let's assume that was another random five. Now, what you will find out is you have 15 random people who cannot put all these conversations together to form a coherent bit and channel the views where the key policy decisions need to be taken. So for me, personally, I think the, init the IAP initiative is fantastic. I think this is where I would really say that um, not only have things been achieved, but there is actually even more uh, leeway to do a lot more not just with this cohort, but with the subsequent ones uh, to come. Um, again, um, mindful of time, uh, let me hand back to you, Christian. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Rooks, for being uh, very generous uh, in understanding that uh, we have time, uh, which uh, is time is not our friend, actually, at this moment. <laughs> and uh, we are we are going to close actually uh, to this this panel, and uh, we have our tech question. And uh, Desiree, uh, you've given us perspectives which are very, very uh, informative. And, and now we, we want to move into how this, this, this is able to shape uh, bigger policy. Okay. Uh, what role has the U.S. government played in standing up, uh, to st and stand up the U.N. Permanent Forum for People of African Descent? And what long-term accomplishment do you hope to see come from this? How much time do I have to answer? <laughs> okay, I'm having the statistics. But let's say three minutes. Okay, I will try to keep it brief because I, I do want to try and get at least one audience question. Um, so I'm really glad that you asked about this because I'm very excited about it. I'm actually, uh, I was in Geneva last week for the launch. Uh, this is the first time the UN has created a permanent forum for people of African descent. What does that mean? It means that there is an acknowledgement that people of African descent around the world, in, in the, on the continent and outside the continent, face unique challenges, and that there needs to be a space where people of African descent can convene to provide guidance and suggestions on how the UN and member states can address those challenges. This is historic, um, and it has been a long time in the making, but I will acknowledge 
that the horrific murder of George Floyd here in the United States in 2020, I think gave it the necessary impetus to finally get across the finish line. Um, and so it's, it saddens me that it took such a horrific tragedy, but I hope that we can find that something long-term and sustainable will come from that horrific tragedy. Um, and in it, last week in Geneva, it was just such a beautiful and joyful celebration, um, which I'm really glad because I was worried that it would be so somber because the challenges we face are real and they're significant and they are global. However, it is important to acknowledge the resilience, the beauty, the diversity, um, and the ingenuity of people of African descent around the world and all of our contributions. Um, and so it was such a wonderful, I've never felt that kind of energy in the UN. Um, and actually in the first session uh, to kick it off, there was an Afro uh, Honduran band, jazz band um, and dancers on the floor of the UN. <laughs> Um, that performed. And I just thought that was so perfect because it was, um, again, an acknowledgement of the seriousness of the challenges while also acknowledging the vibrancy and the joy um, that, you know, that that uh, sort of um, emanate from the continent and from people of African descent and all of our diversity around the world. So I'm hopeful for this forum because um, it not only is uh, just the UN body, we really put the United States strongly supported the creation of the forum, but we also strongly pushed to ensure that there would be um, space for robust civil society participation. And this is really important because in order for the forum to be credible, for it to uh, come up with, I think, tangible solutions to these real world problems, it has to be informed by the people on the ground, by the people serving the communities, the people that know the real world challenges and the real issues and the solutions that are needed to solve them. Um, and so I think it, it, it's exciting, it's an exciting moment. Um, you know, I think there was an acknowledgement from everyone that uh, this moment, it, we it's a come incumbent upon us to continue the momentum. Just because we had this beautiful launch doesn't mean that all the world's uh, challenges are gonna be solved. But I think um, it provided the hope and the impetus as well as the, um, I think the the pressure, frankly, from civil society that were present at the forum to actually come up with tangible and concrete solutions. And um, finally, I would just say that this has the potential to be a space that really unites the entire diaspora, which I think can be really powerful. If this is a space where all Africans get behind, as well as people of African descent from around the globe, it could be incredibly powerful. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, I, I'm picking the whole conversation around uh, African diaspora, which has strength. I mean, diaspora in general, uh, it would be able to add a lot. And I, I would like to note that uh, the IAPS were actually featured this year's uh, list of 100 most influential young people of African descent. Congratulations. I mean, thank you so much. So, I, I want to go to Dr. Rooks now. Doctor, we don't have so much time. And uh, Desiree is saying she wants to take one question. Am I right? If, if there's time. If there's time. Okay, doctor. So please, in two minutes, uh, I would like us to reflect on, on, on this, I mean, short. As, a, as young people continually push for stronger roles in decision-making processes on the regional and country level, what can governments do better to include youth voices and perspectives? I mean, in, in two minutes, doctor, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Christian, and it will be a, a, a big honor to, to, you know, to to keep this really short so Desiree can have a go. I've, I've, I'm enjoying my intervention more than the sound of my voice. Uh, but uh, two things very quickly. Uh, the first thing I would say is there's a continental framework on youth based and security. And I think what that framework does is to really encapsulate what is required to move the YPS agenda forward, not at only at the continental and regional levels, but also at the member state levels. And so we're working hard with uh, member states to encourage them to have national action plans on YPS, not plans that seek to adopt the continental framework uh, as is, but those that will speak to you know, the national specificities of the challenges and the opportunities that exist within um, their, their, their different environments. So that's the one thing. The second thing, the answer is really flipping the question on its head to say, what should young people be doing? Um, because I think in, in, in this regard, there are three things we need. One, capacity enhancement. Two, 
opportunities to um, be in certain um, spaces, and three, um, to take proper advantage of the presence in those spaces. However well the government creates those spaces, if young people are not prepared and skilled and knowledgeable to take on those spaces, then it's a waste of space. So that's always been my thing to say, yes, the government has a role, but I think it's a shared responsibility, one that young people need to take on more. So this generation, you have it all, a mobile phone. But what are you doing? Kim Kardashian's dress to the party last night or way to advance YPS? Choice is yours. Um, <laughs> now I think, what are now, you now I think um, I'll stop there so that I can hear a little more from Desiree as well. I'm looking forward to that. But thank you so much, Kristen. This has been really, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rooks. You're talking about uh, young people are equal partners in this process. And now to the room. Uh, this has been a very interesting conversation, but we have a, a chance just for one question. Uh, because time is not on our side. So, um, is there a question in the room? Okay. Yes. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, Please, can you, you kindly introduce yourself? Yes, and then your question is Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Muhammad Ali Abdullah. I'm the chairman of the Libyan Foreign Bank and the uh, Libyan uh, Special Envoy to the U.S. Uh, my question is, uh, as, a, as an investment bank, we have a lot of investments in uh, seven different African countries, and focusing on the youth uh, is, is something very important to us. However, it's very interesting to see that the initiative that yourself, Desiree, is uh, leading is under the State Department. Um, hello? Okay. Um, because, you know, it's a, it's a diplomatic initiative in a way. However, a lot of the issues are not necessarily political or diplomatic, as we heard from the speakers today. A lot of it is more economic, social justice, things like that. So my question is, how do you find the balance between taking the initiative or guiding and, and, and becoming a partner um, at a time when the U.S. brand internationally and even in Africa is a little bit different today than it was 20 years ago? And how do you transform that into practical initiatives that impact the youth on the ground in African countries? A lot of them don't really care about the political history or the legacies. A lot of them are more interested in the current future. And an add-on to that question is there's a lot of competition for the youth in the African continent. You've got you know, Russian, Chinese investors. You've got all other kinds of investors. So how do you balance between that and the practical initiatives that are actually needed? Yeah, that's a great question. And it makes sense for my position to be housed in the State Department because I actually join an array of other specials and ambassadors that are focused on other marginalized groups. So there is a special envoy for LGBTQI plus persons. There is a special advisor for international disability rights. There is uh, the Secretary's Office for Global Women's Issues. There is an ambassador at large for international religious freedoms. And there's an ambassador to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. So I very much see my role as sort of the last of the puzzle. And I would just say a few weeks ago, we actually, the State Department just named a new special envoy specifically for you. So I hope that in future conversations, she is here. Um, but out of fairness, since I think this is her second week, um, it didn't make sense for me to have her join. Um, but, you know, in, in to clarify a couple of things, my role is not political. It's not um, about the political empowerment of marginalized racial and ethnic uh, communities. It is about the enjoyment of their human rights. It is about the basic premise in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Now we know that for far too many members of marginalized racial and ethnic communities, that is an aspiration, but not a lived reality, right? Um, um, the unfortunate reality is that they are constantly and habitually um, prevent it from living up to their full potential and from living up to their full dignity and enjoyment of the, all of their human rights simply because of their race or their ethnicity. So my job is to acknowledge that and to ensure that U.S. foreign policy pushes back against that. And it is part of this administration's commitment to putting human rights at the center of our foreign policy. It is aspirational, right? This is not going to be easy, um, and this is not this is not a, a role in which there are going to be many quick wins. Um, the re the unfortunate reality is that uh, the systemic racism has been baked into many countries' um, policies, institutions, laws for centuries, 
um, present company not excluded. Um, so, you know, I think that is the reality in which I have to acknowledge. Um, and so this is not going to be an easy job, nor is it going to be a job with a lot of significant quick wins. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have to shy away from the hard work um, and often uncomfortable work, right? And acknowledging, again, where U.S. foreign policy has contributed to these inequities. Um, but this secretary, this president is committed to it. Um, we have the mandate um, that the president issued on day one in Executive Order 13985 that mandated a whole of government approach to advancing racial equity and support for other underserved communities, which means people with disabilities, um, LGBTQI plus persons, women and girls and all their diversity, et cetera, et cetera. And we believe that leading with our values and this kind of human rights center foreign policy um, will be more sustainable and more impactful in the long term than other sort of transactional kinds of policies. Thank you so much, uh, Desiree. We have come to the close of uh, this, this very inspiring session. Uh, being your humble moderator, uh, Christian Achalake from Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've had uh, Desiree uh, here today. Uh, Desiree is the US Special Representative for Racial Equity. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, we've had Dr. Ruth Apple, um, who could not join us in person, uh, from the AU Youth for Peace program. Thank you all for making time to join us. Maybe we'll give them a round of applause. Uh, Thank you so much, the organizers, for having a young person uh, to moderate the session. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.